Good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Dr. Dima DeVirus, Chief of Pathology at Grand River Hospital and Clinical Lead for Cancer Care Ontario. On behalf of Cancer Care Ontario, the Canadian Partnership Against Cancer and the Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to welcome everyone to today's educational session on CAP Cancer Protocol for Stomach and Gastric HER2. Before I introduce our speaker and we get formally underway, I'd like to take care of a few housekeeping items. Today's presentation will be approximately 90 minutes in length and will include approximately 60 minutes of presentation time to be followed by 30 minutes of question and answer. The session is being recorded and will be made available to all participants via email links once the recording becomes available. Both presentation and recorded presentations are eligible for CME credit upon the completion and submission of evaluation form available electronically. The information for accessing the uh, evaluation form was provided in the notice for the session previously distributed. Please do note that the CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued for one month from the presentation date. The recorded sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time CME certificates will only be issued for one month. Refer to the session notice for that deadline date. Please note that everyone's line has been automatically muted for today's presentation. Due to a large number of participants, uh, we are un unable to troubleshoot any WebEx connectivity issues as part of this call. If you are having difficulties accessing the WebEx portion of this teleconference, please call the WebEx support line at Eight six six two nine three two three nine. Just repeat that number again. One eight six six two nine two three nine. We encourage you to submit questions at any time during the presentation using the chat feature. Questions on how to use the WebEx chat window. Please refer to the documentation previously distributed. During the question and answer portion of the uh, presentation, in order to avoid question collisions, I will pose the submitted questions on your behalf as long as time permits and in the order in which they appear. In the window, please include the following information, the institution's name, the name of the individual posing the question, and the question. So it is now my distinct pleasure to introduce Dr. Kathy uh, Stroitko. Uh, Kathy obtained her BSc at the University of Waterloo in the Cooperative Program in Biochemistry in 1989. She earned a Master's Degree in Clinical Biochemistry at the University of Toronto in 1991, training under the supervision of Dr. Daniel Drucker. On completion of a Master's Degree, she entered medical school at the University of Toronto and graduated in 1994. She had an Anatomical Pathology Residency Program at the University of Toronto and the Royal College Exam in 1999. After she completed a two-year fellowship in gastrointestinal pathology with Dr. Rob Riddell and Dr. Krotoru at McMahon University in Hamilton, Ontario. In 2001, she joined the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathobiology at the University of Toronto as she began her appointment as a star pathologist at St. Mark's Hospital. She presently specializes in gastrointestinal pathology, particularly upper gastrointestinal tract malignancy, but considers herself a general surgical pathologist. She's be the director of the surgical pathology program at St. Michael's Hospital. So without further ado, I introduce uh, Dr. Kathy Stroika to give today's talk on the cancer protocol for stomach and gastric her to new. Thank you, introduction, Demo, and uh, thanks for CCO to, for inviting me to give this talk. Uh, some of you may have seen the presentation that uh, Christine Bresden Mosley and I have done on gastric cancer and HER2 testing in Ontario in the past year or so, and there's a little bit of overlap as I've used some of the introduction slides for this talk. We have some financial disclosure, actually, which is, I guess, a bit odd for pathologists, um, particularly from Hoffman La Roche and Ventana, who have subsidized our validation of HER2 testing. And the Dexo Smith Klein is kind of a hopeful thing, as we hope to get a grant from them, but it hasn't been formalized yet. So I'm going to cover um, the gastric synoptic checklist and focus m on the changes in that checklist. But I'm also going to speak particularly about some up potentially upcoming changes in surgical techniques, which might impact how we practice 
and also I was asked specifically to talk about HER2 testing in gastric cancer. Gastric cancer in North America is probably uh, underestimated because if you look at worldwide, it's actually the second leading cause of cancer mortality, and it's a very common malignancy overall. But in North America, it's, it's significantly less common. It's only the eighth leading cause of mortality and the 13th most common malignancy. That gives us a significant burden of cases in both the U.S. and Canada, and I would point out that that estimation of 3,300 cases in Canada is increased approximately four or 500 cases from the estimated number of cases uh, a couple of years previously. So the number is actually increasing, but still most of the cases are in developing nations and not so much in Canada. Cases have been declining in the U.S. since the 1930s overall, despite that recent increase, but that seems to be mostly in the distal cancer cases, whereas proximal cardia and gastroesophageal junction cancer incidence has been rising sharply. There are obviously a number of cancers that arise in the stomach, but really I'm only going to be talking about adenocarcinomas, and we're just not going to worry about the other ones. When you look at the incidence of gastric cancer, you really focus on Southeast Asia, where the incidence is extremely high, but still there's quite a high rate in Russia and East Europe. There's considerably high rates in Italy, um, Portugal, Spain, but also in South America where the rates are quite high compared to our rates here in North America. The factors probably parallel that rate in that helicobacter infection is thought to be the main cause of intestinal type gastric cancer and the rate of gastric cancer essentially follows where we think most of the helicobacter is and certainly Russia, Eastern Europe, South America and the Mediterranean countries as well as Southeast Asia still have a very high rate of helicobacter infection. But there's other causes such as advanced age, smoking, being a male and it. Low fruits and vegetables for sure but also salt, high meat and smoked preserved foods is a risk for distal gastric cancer. We think most gastroesophageal cancers are probably reflux-induced, and therefore they may well be linked in North America to the increase in obesity of the North American population. For gastric cancers, the risks are not very well understood. Certainly some of them occur in patients with helicobacter, but not all of them. Then the hereditary form, where you have a mutation in the e-cadherin gene, we don't really know. Recurrence is huge. These patients, if they have uh, anything other than an early gastric cancer, have a very high rate of recurrence. They occur early. It's not like breast cancer with somebody who come back 10 or 15 years later. If they're going to recur, they occur quickly and tend to do very badly. It's usually local regional failure, but also obviously there are some metastases. And particularly for gastric diff cancer, peritoneal dissemination is a significant factor. Changes, <coughs> sorry, I have a, a cold. I'm just hoping my voice holds out on this. The Gap Cancer Synoptic Reporting Checklist uh, that's currently on the CAP website has notes of specific changes in these areas. So we'll go through the checklist and look at these particularly. Just to point out that the Gap Cancer Synoptic Checklist specifically does not apply to G junction tumors. And the definition that they're using is a tumor that arises in the proximal stomach that crosses the junction is included. So that means cardiac tumors that touch the GE junction do go into this checklist. They go into the esophagus checklist. Uh, is when you're trying to figure out exactly where the tumor is and does it touch the junction. So the thick information for gastric cancer is essentially unchanged. What the specimen is, what the procedure is, I point out specifically endoscopic mucosal resections, which are becoming more common than they used to be, the tumor site as best as you can determine, and the tumor size. Histologic type is another major area where we ha must focus. Um, the low classification is the one that uh, has been generally most commonly used. We often think of tumors in this area as being either intestinal or diffuse, but also mixed, where you see approximately equal amounts of both intestinal and diffuse type cancer. There's intestinal versus diffuse, where intestinal has the classic gland formation, whereas diffuse has the classic signet ring cells streaming through without any evidence of true gland formation. But diffuse cancer can also have not only the classic ring type cells, 
but they can also have a very streaming cords of cells appearance where the cells can be very eosinophilic, they can be plasmacytoid, they don't have to have signet rings. They just tend to show this sort of cords and streaming nests of cells. We probably underdiagnosed the mixed type where you see significant components of both, um, and we probably try to push it more into one or the other, but we should remember that these can occur and it can affect how we, we grade and and uh, the outcome of these cases. So here's where you can see definitely an intestinal type here, and then some ill-defined stuff in the middle here where on ECAT here and it loses staining. And of how this has a diffuse appearance, uh, giving this mixed diagnosis. The DHO classification is given as an alternate optional classification, and they separate this out by tubular, which is essentially a intestinal. It includes pretty differentiated high-grade stuff, so don't think tubular as the breast cancer tubular of well-differentiated. This is just a terminology for intestinal type. Poorly cohesive is essentially where what is a diffuse um, signet ring type cancer. Uh, in some ways, uh, it's more mixed. I, I find this definition a little difficult. And then diffuse is pure diffuse. Mucinous is fairly straightforward, and papillary is a particular uh, appearance which show in a later picture. Here's a typical mucinous type tumor. It should have at least 50% extracellular mucin pools. It may contain scattered signet ring cells, but a lot of the time you get these kind of peeled off strips of epithelium floating about in the mucin. This is a papillary lesion where you get this a papillary fronds, uh, which is often hard to tell whether it's invasive or not. Fibrovascular cores, it's often a low-grade tumor. These types which come under under this group are hepatoid, medullary or carcinoma with lymphoid stroma, lymphoid carcinomas, which I'm not going to discuss anymore, uh, tumors with adenoneuroendocrine, very uncommon tumors, squamous cell carcinomas, again uncommon, undifferentiated where it's just so poorly differentiated you can't really tell what it is. The hepatoid one, this one is actually a met to the liver. It looks like HCC, but this is a tiny little nodule in the bulk of the tumor was in the stomach, they often express high amounts of alpha fetoprotein. This is from a paper that Dr. Chetty published of a medullary carcinoma of the stomach where it's a medullary cancer just like any other medullary cancer with considerable lymphoid infiltrate surrounding it. In the stomach, it seems to be associated with Epstein-Barr infection, and it might have a more favorable prognosis here. Cell carcinomas are quite common. This is one we had here, um, I think last year, where the P63 is quite strong. You can get adenosquamous or pure squamous. The important thing is to make sure that it's not attached and coming down from the gastroesophageal junction or the distal esophagus. And here it's just sheet-like tumor, poorly differentiated or undifferentiated, uh, very high-grade tumor. In notes from the CAT protocol, it favors the WHO terminology. I wonder if maybe we should at least for what I would use both, simply because the medical oncologists are used to diffuse versus intestinal type, and they won't necessarily know what you're talking about when you say tubular. The checklist doesn't really have any place to put in uh, considerations of hereditary gastric cancer. These are the patients with the E-cadherin mutation and CDH1 gene. You don't really have a, an option in the checklist for, for multiple tumors. Remember, in these cases, you have to submit the entire well, not because it really should be the entire gastric wall because they often have multiple small tumors. Um, and Paul uh, sent me this picture a while back of an in situ lesion in one of these patients. And here you can see a tiny, tiny microfocus of a tumor in a patient with one of these mutations. Great, easy. Uh, it's not anything new here. We have to remember that signet ring cancers are by definition high grade and you put them in as a G3. Stent tumor, this overlaps with the staging, so I'm going to talk more about this in the staging. And I think the phrasing has been uh, modified in overall in the mar margins. It's a bit simpler, but the main update is to add endoscopic mucosal resection re uh, margins here because the deep resection margin here is obviously not going to be the serosal surface. Uh, and so basically asking you to classify the deep margin of the EMR and the serosal margins of the EMR if you can. Now, for those of you who have not seen mucosal resection specimens, usually if they're doing multiple EMR specimens, 
organs. They suck them up into a special endoscope, and you could basically amputate off about one centimeter of the mucosa at a time, and off, hopefully get some submucosa with it. And then scoop them out as a group, so it ends up being like puzzle pieces that you have no idea how they're supposed to fit together. So it's an extremely difficult to be really sure what the true margin is. If you have six pieces and they all have tumor, you have no idea what the true margin is. Um, if you end up with a surgeon who's trained in Japan and does endoscopic submucosal dissections, then it's coming out on block, and you can definitely say true margins. But I think a lot of the time, the mucosal margins in this are going to be cannot be assessed. And I also point out here, considering that they're asking about low-grade glandular dysplasia, etc., that WHO is encouraging intraepithelial neoplasia, as we're all trying to get on the same terminology uh, wavelength here in the GI tract. This shows the importance of negative margins, that the survival is considerably different between negative margins and positive margins in gastric cancer, in gastrectomies. Treatment is essentially the same as anywhere else uh, in the colon, et cetera, so there's no real change here. Vascular space invasion is a single group here where venous invasion is not separated out. I would say that venous invasion by itself is maybe not a lot of good articles on this, but probably by itself it's a separate prognostic factor. So if you have venous versus lymphatic invasion, it's probably worth a comment here. And just to point out that in the notes area, it, it specifies the tumor in lymphatics or veins doesn't change the T stage. So if the tumor is getting out further in the uh, bulk of the tumor, is that doesn't change anything. Perineural invasion is fairly self-evident. Staining is essentially the same as colon in that you have, uh, we generally worry about this because if this was all that was there, I don't think I would fill that the synoptic out for this. You start with PT1A. One of the statements is that the PT1 is no longer, uh, you can't really click on PT1 by itself. And the reason that they've done that is because you have to check either PT1A or PT1B. And then PT2 is muscular as prea. Then P3 is into the perigastric fat. And PT4 is serosa, whereas 4A is just serosa, and 4B is adjacent structures. This is just emphasizing this. Uh, the phrasing in the changes to the synoptic report says that it was changed from a selectable to a non-selectable element, which is a little actually confusing until you realize that they are just saying that because they're telling you you have to select T1A or T1B. And the reason they've done this is because there's a significant difference between T1A, which is essentially intramucosal. It's in the lamina propria up to into the muscular mucosae, but it doesn't get into the submucosa. There's a significant difference in outcome. Lymph node metastases in the T1A are only 1% to 2% risk. Once you get to the submucosa, it's at least 15%, depending on how deep in the submucosa it is. So therefore, the PT1A tumors are often treatable with mucosal resection or mucosal ablation techniques rather than a full uh, gastrectomy or partial gastrectomy. Anytime you can save someone that massive surgery, it's a good option. Or it's merely a phrasing change, so you don't need to really worry about that. So here in mucosal carcinoma, and as I said, lamina propria invasion can get into the muscle, but not through the muscle. If you're looking at these cases, frequently we are here because we get a lot of mucosal resections on this case. It's interesting that these cases generally don't have any, if or very little, desmoplasia until they get into the submucosa. So here we have a case where you've got invasion through the muscle and into the submucosal tissue. And T, invasion of the muscular propria is PT2. Here you go into the perigastric uh, fat, PT3. T3 versus D T4, according to the definition, getting into the gastrocolic or gastrohepatic ligaments or into the greater or lesser omentum, unless it goes through the visceral peritoneum to get there, it's still a T3. Uh, diagrammatically from the notes part of the synoptic stuff on the CAP website, this is what they're trying to show, where here's the muscularis propria and the tumor's out and into the lesser omentum. But unless it transgresses the serosa to come around here to get there, it still counts as a T3. And distal extension into duodenum does change the T stage. And here we have 
a diffuse gastric cancer coming right across the last little bit and ending up on the outside. Now, the lymph node obviously gets you straight into the end stage, depending on where the lymph nodes are. Or PN1 is one to two lymph nodes, and two, three to six, and as you go on through here, uh, obviously here you have a, a, a and just say that no lymph nodes were submitted or found. And again, the specific definite how many lymph nodes you have and how many are involved. Discontinuous tumor nodules here is different than in the colon. Remember in the colon you actually have a separate end stage for discontinuous tumor nodules, which is important for cases where there are no definite positive lymph nodes. In the stomach, these are considered to be regional lymph node metastases, and you just don't worry about it. For all we know, it could be venous, but we tend to assume they are residual lymph node uh, deposits. But once you go onto the peritoneal surface, they're distant metastases, and that counts as M1. So it, in a way, it depends where these nodules are. So discontinuous nodules in the subserosal tissue adjacent to the stomach are N, whereas nodules on the peritoneal surface are M. Make a specific point about lymph nodes and gastrectomies because I think this is going to change in the too distant future. Certainly, the oncologists are talking about this quite a lot. Surgeons look at the lymph nodes as uh, 16 separate groups, and they divide into four, 16 er, sorry, 16 areas and four groups, and they call these N1 to 4, which is not the same as our N stages. So there one is perigastric nodes along the greater and lesser curvature, close to the wall of the stomach. Two is pushed out around the regional blood vessels, the celiac axis and the aorta. And three is getting further away, and four is the further away periaortic nodes. So looking at where lymph node metastases are N or M, it depends where they are. Close to lymph nodes along the greater curvature in the area of the pancreas and the spleen and the lesser curvature of the stomach, all of these still count in the N stage, whereas M or definitely more metastatic lesions are intra-abdominal lymph nodes. Once you get more distance away from the stomach, they actually count as a met and not as a positive node. And this is digrammatic. Uh, Represent of where the lymph nodes are. So here's the lesser curvature node area and the curvature node area. And when you're looking at the N2 ones, you're on the celiac axis further back here, behind the stomach, usually. And one way to think about that is when they're doing these resections, a D1 lymphadenectomy is getting the lymph nodes close in around the stomach on the greater and lesser curve, and a D2 lymphadenectomy is putting things out use behind the stomach towards the blood vessels of the celiac axis and the aorta. Most commonly in North America, hysterectomies are being done with limited node dissections. Certainly, other studies were done with incomplete resection of the N1 nodes, whereas a good D1 resection is considered complete resection of those N1 nodes, the ones just beside the stomach. A D2 resection is considered to be resection of all the N2 nodes. For the last 10 years, South Asia, this is the standard of practice. Now in Europe, this is also becoming the standard of practice. And essentially what I uh, hear is that if you're in Denmark, the students there don't get paid unless they find at least 15 lymph nodes for their gastrectomies. They also have to do a certain number of cases a year, or they also don't get paid. And several trials comparing these lesser lymph node sections with the D2 resection. I'll show you some of the results from this. These slides are courtesy of Dr. Christine Bresden Masley, um, and they're from last year's ASCO reports uh, there of this N0 versus N0 survival. Look at the difference in survival for if you have more than 15 lymph nodes, even within N0, so that you aren't seeing true METs in these cases, but if you get more than 15 lymph nodes, your 50% survival is way out here at about 100 months. If you find less than 15 nodes, your 50% survival is around 60 months. Similarly, if you find N1, so if lymph node's positive, even here, there's a huge difference in survival depending on how many lymph nodes you get. 
And the other uh, comparison, looking at the SEER database of gastric cancers, most of these were D0 or D1 resections. Um, Memorial Sloan Kettering, which has a, a large service where they're doing quite a few D2 resections, versus the Japanese and Korean numbers. Only gastric cancers aren't that dissimilar, though. Look at the survival in the in the South Asian countries versus even the SEER database. Obviously, Memorial is doing quite well, but even the gastric cancers here are doing significantly poorly. And when you start looking at more advanced tumors here, look at the survival in Japan and Korea for these high-stage gastric cancers compared to here. Huge. This implies that even though we aren't looking that hard for these, these D2 resections are probably removing micrometastases and isolated tumor cells. Considering that the gastric bed is most often where gastric cancer comes back, there must be little islands of tumor in there that we don't actually search for the way we do in breast cancer. But taking the nose out must protect the patient from uh, recurrence in these areas. So the oncologists joke that if you had a gastric cancer, you should actually be going to Korea to get your surgery because they will do a much better job there of getting it all out. So this, what oncologists are starting to say is that a standardized D2 resection makes a huge survival difference for patients. Now, again, maybe it's biology. Maybe Southeast Asian cancers have a slightly different biology than North American gastric cancer, and that's why they do better. We won't do that until we have better studies of D2 resections in North America to to, uh, to be able to tell. So what colleges are saying is they see an R0 resection with a D2 adenectomy with at least 15 lymph nodes resected. So when we are grossing the specimens, I know we all look for nodes, but probably like it was when colon cancer, we put in as many lymph nodes as we thought we were seeing. But it wasn't until CCO came and said, well, you better get 12 or else we're going to, you know, give a bad QA on this. Then we would go back and we'd try our best to find lymph nodes. And I think we really should start doing that for gastric cancer resections. We should be finding at least 16 to 20. And I know our surgeon here actually does do these surgeries most of the time. But he will call if we don't get more than that number. And he will say, you know, I took out more tissue. You please go and look, and usually you can find more. In East Asia, apparently, the surgeons are actually almost staging these lymph nodes, taking the different stations and putting them into a little cassette thing, you know, like a little bill cassette uh, things, and then labeling them. So they know exactly where they've taken things that feel like lymph nodes, and then they send them to pathology separately. There are concerns that these extended surgeries have increased complications, uh, but recent studies don't seem to follow that up. It does seem to be that these should be experienced surgeons who have cases to keep up abilities. And therefore, I suspect that there will be an argument to centralize the surgery at larger centers in the near future so that the surgeons are doing more and uh, getting out of it. And something that was also shown at ASCO 2012, and this comes from the National Comprehensive Cancer Network, which is uh, basically a group that put together guidelines. And this is their 2011 guideline for the U.S. that they should be doing a D2 resection with at least 15 or greater lymph nodes. So this is coming from the oncology side, but I strongly suspect that this is going to push back on us in the near future. And there will be considerable pressure on both the surgeons and us to show that, that this is what's being done. I'll just also point out that the staging has changed since 2007. This doesn't really change much for us, but I would just point out to you the stage migration here, that back in 2007, an N1 was 1 to 6 lymph nodes, and N2 was 7 to 15, so that's considerably different. If look at their staging. You could have a stage 4 with a stage tumor with lymph nodes, um, or metastases, and the 2010 is different. That now, the N stage is considerably different, so N1 is 1 to 2, and as we said before, I won't go through that again. And, whoops, sorry, and now stage 4 is purely metastatic tumor, so there is definitely changes in staging that have come through. 
And the age definitely predicts survival. Um, oncologists love these survival curves. Uh, this one really demonstrates how bad gastric cancer really is. Even the stage one cancers, the ones limited to the mucosa, submucosa, the survival slowly drops. But the stage four cancers have awful, awful survival. And obviously, distant metastases is fairly straightforward. And again, remember that some lymph node mets will end up in this category. The additional pathologic findings encourage people to actually look for helicobacter. It doesn't make any difference to that patient most of the time. Um, for high stage cancers, finding helicobacter in the background won't affect that patient at all. I think it's important for those of us when we're going back to do studies to have that evidence to say where what background is this tumor coming out of. But I would also point out that there were studies in Japan that patients with early gastric cancer had lower risk of recurrence if they had treatment of the helicobacter that was there with the early stage cancer. And that by that I mean a T1 tumor. So it can affect outcome in patients if you say that. Uh, of course, saying intestinal metaplasia, dysplasia, and et cetera, is, it's again helpful to find out what's going on. I'm going to talk outside of the checklist now about advanced gastric cancer, uh, and this is defined as cases which have recurred or metastasized after cancer, or they were too advanced to resect in the per first place, which I've heard some oncologists refer to as the peak and shriek that the surgeon opens up, says, oh, can't do anything here, and they just close, and we never really get a specimen other than the biopsy. So this is a very much oncology slide, but all I want to point out is that this is awful. Survival best supportive care is three months in these patients, three months. With chemotherapy, you can get that up to six months. With the best, strongest, most awful chemotherapy out there, you can survive six months with advanced gastric cancer. Again, don't care about what the uh, ECF versus EOX, so don't worry about that. But all I want to point out is that, here again, you can push some patients out to about 11 months with EOX. Like less than a year on average, these patients do, and the curve just falls like that. And the end of that is talking about HER2, because this is the ancillary study bit, which is now added on to the end of the synoptic report. And a lot of details here. Most of you will be on pending when you're signing out the gastric cancer things. And the reason for that is I'm going to explain further. There's a lot of detail here. <coughs> Sorry. So for this is because of this study, the TOGA trial, which was published back in 2010. And this is the first trial looking re at um, positive result in targeted therapy in gastric cancer. HER2 re receptor we're all fairly familiar with in breast cancer normally expressed in very minimal levels in gastric tissue. And I'll remind you that uh, HER2 likes to dimerize either with itself as the two HER2 molecules or it binds to HER1, HER3, or HER4. The advent of trastuzumab, uh, which is also known as Herceptin, was a major uh, treatment advance for, for, for breast cancer. And we know that it likes to bind very strongly to the extracellular domain of HER2, but does not bind to HER3 or HER4. It's a human amino acid sequence, except for a little bit of mouse at the end, so it is generally tolerized uh, very well for humans. And in the TOGA, they look at outcome of overall survival in all patients with two uh, positivity. Now, I have to specify this in this slide what the primary point was. This was all patients that were HER2 positive. It means they were either positive, I positive, by ish, or by the immunohistochemistry. So they either had protein on the surface of the cell, or they had amplification of the gene. So here, compared to their chemotherapy backbone, the improvement survival was up to 13.8 months. But if you looked at those who were really strongly positive, either the immunohistochemistry chemistry 3 plus, so lots of protein on the cell, or 2 plus ish positive, so moderate amounts of protein in the cell, but gene amplification, survival benefit went up to 16 months. 
Now, two pathologists, that just doesn't sound like very much at all because what, months, four, months, four or five months better survival. <coughs> but to oncologists, this was immensely significant. And it really the first treatment that really offered any hope of significantly extending the lifespan in these patients who are otherwise going to die extremely quickly. So they were extremely excited about this. And it um, has become a major treatment point in gastric cancer. Not the same as in breast cancer, though. Breast cancer, you can almost predict what cases are going to be HER2 positive. Usually the very poorly differentiated one, they're ERP or negative, and you just look at them and you think, I'll bet this is going to be HER2 positive. The gastric or gastroesophageal junction cancer, HER2 positive tumors are almost always the well differentiated intestinal type adenocarcinomas. <coughs> the tumor subtype also matters because the diffuse carcinoma is very rarely positive for HER2, 5% in the TOGA trial. And of the 500 or so gastric cancers that we've tested here at St. Mike's, we've seen two diffuse gastric cancer diffuse type that were positive. So in the, again, this isn't going to help diffuse gastric cancer. It's still going to be an awful outcome for those patients. There's also significant location differences that tumors at the junction are more often positive for HER2 than the more distal gastric cancers. This thing is also different from the breast. We accept, frankly, considerably less staining. Uh, it can be very patchy and heterogeneous. Because of the patchiness in these cases, we accept a, a group of five cells in a biopsy specimen with positive staining, or in a reaction specimen, at least 10% of the tumor to count as a positive um, stain. Also different from breast cancer, it doesn't have to be full circumference of the cells. It's kind of going here. Because of these differences, it's not that breast cancer um, and gastric cancer are so different. And people who read breast cancer HER2 certainly could look at these. But I have to tell you, it's difficult going back and forth. I've tried it, and I'm sure if Jason is listening to this, he's kind of laughing because it's very easy to start overcalling the breast cases if you read a lot of gastric, and it's easy to call gastric if you read a lot of breast. So the general recommendation in Ontario has been that GI pathologists should be reading these and that they should see enough numbers to maintain competence. Here's some examples of the incomplete staining that you can see, whereas in breast, we insist that it has to be full circumference of the cell, otherwise it's uh, dubious. Here you accept the fact that a lot of the time all you're seeing is lines between the cell. The basal membrane of the cell is often positive or the basal lateral membrane. So you just kind of U-shape or just lines between the cell. You often see marked heterogeneity in these patients in the tumors. In this case, it's an intestinal type where you see strong staining up here and it's off here and then it's completely absent over here. This is fairly unusual in breast cancer, but it's extremely common in gastric cancer. Dean so, up at Sunnybrook kindly sent me these pictures that uh, demonstrate how we think that some of the heterogeneity may well be due to specimen fixation issues. Here's a, this case up here, mucosa, fairly strong staining. Out by the serosal surface, also strong staining. But the set of the gastric wall and the set of the tumor is pretty close to negative. In some of these cases, it's almost certainly fixation. And I point out that we obsess about our breast cancer cases now. We know that cold ischemic time is important, and so the PAs are all in there, getting the tumor, getting into form one as quickly as possible. Meanwhile, gastrectomy is sitting there on the table, marinating in its own acid, um, and possibly destroying the signal that we need in order to make the, the diagnosis of HER2 amplification. So I would encourage everybody to... It's not prioritized to stomach, but I really think we need to focus on all tumors because you don't know what's going to be the next uh, biomarker that's going to come up as a treatment uh, focus. We need to really be careful with all our cancer cases and get them fixed as quickly as possible. Some of the heterogeneity is real. This was a, a case I had recently of a mixed tumor over here. You can put the H&E in, but there's diffuse gastric cancer here. 
some intestinal here and some intestinal here. And you can see even at this low power, there's a very strong staining in this fragment. And it kind of fades out here. And again, it's here. So you can't blame this on fixation because it's a biopsy. And therefore, it should be uh, equally fixed in all fragments. So this is Dr. Ruschoff and Dr. Hanna's paper showing the how we score these things, essentially. More or less, the staining depends on what power on your microscope can you see the lines between the cells. Here you see at 5 by, you can clearly see that this is staining. You probably can higher power just to make sure this isn't cytoplasmic staining that's mixing you up. Obviously here at 40 power, you can see nice clean staining of the wall with only minimal cytoplasmic staining. Two staining is considerably weaker, and you can see just little lines of the cells. Here you are at 20 power. And at 40 power, you can see a little bit of weak staining, but hardly anything. So this would be a 1 plus, and essentially that's negative. Here's some of our cases, a nice strong 3 plus. This would count as an uh, amplified or positive test. And the case had uh, dual-ish positivity because there's lots of black. There's some almost hidden in the background, and I hope you can actually see it. Uh, but there's tons of black signals, which is the HER2 signals, whereas the red is the sep 7 Here's one of our two planing ones, only visible at moderate magnification. It's a little stronger than the one in Dr. Hanna's uh, paper. But plus ones are where we need to do ish to see if there's truly amplification. Same as in breast, only just the degree of staining here is different than in breast. Most two plus cases are going to be negative by ish. And in this case, this is the sun on this one, and the ratio was one. Another poorly differentiated and possibly diffuse cancer, which has a little bit of weak staining between the membranes, and it was negative on ish. The dual ish, which is non-amplified, you see fairly equal numbers of red and black signals. So do we count as positive? It depends. It matters more uh, on the protein on the surface. So a tumor that's 3 plus, HC, it's eligible for trastuzumab therapy regardless of the ish results. There are a proportion in the TOGA trial and by our results of test cases that do not have gene amplification. So how we get more protein on the surface in those cases, we don't know the mechanism of that, but we believe that they do respond. So 3 plus is positive no matter what. 3 plus requires ish positivity, and ish is ratio greater than 2 absolute HER2 count greater than 6. If, if they're 0 or 1, regardless of what the ish is, and again, in the TOGA trial, there were some cases that showed ish amplification. So the gene was there in greater copy numbers, but the protein wasn't getting to the cell membrane. And the TOGA trial, these didn't actually respond to trastuzumab therapy. And actually, the statistics said that they did worse, but there was a small number of cases. So so statistically, that's a bit dubious. But anyway, they certainly don't respond. So because of that, the IHC 0 and 1 plus are not eligible for therapy regardless of what the ish says. So this is what we will get to as a testing algorithm. So 1 plus, they're done. They're negative, and they're not going to get treatment. If they're 3 plus, they are eligible for treatment. 2 plus. Positive, they're eligible for treatment. Ish negative, they're eligible for treatment. That will be the testing algorithm in the future. Right now, because we've just expanded from two to six testing centers, we actually are doing all cases with IHC and ish until we all have greater experience with it. Uh, and then hopefully, even by the end of the year, we will only be looking at our two plus cases to make sure that uh, we know who is eligible. So thing issues, as I mentioned, fixation is a problem. Uh, are biopsies better than gastrectomy blocks? Probably due to fixation issues, they are. But if it's a few tiny little snippets of tumor, um, it might be better to send a gastrectomy block if that's available. We had a couple of cases where the tumor was cut through by the time we went to do the testing. So it can be an issue. And we need to be recommending to our gastroenterologists and whoever else is scoping that we get at least six to eight biopsies of tumor. And I'm sure we've all seen those cases where they get six to eight biopsies, but if it ends up being uh, tumor stuff on the bottom or normal tissue.
So we need to be pushing to get more biopsies of these to make sure we have better specimens. Usually biopsies actually correlate with the resection. And a couple months ago, I would have said, I don't know. But tell Andrea Grin and a group of us did a, a study on a number of cases. We had 128 biopsy resection pairs. And I was actually a bit told by this result that pretty much 97% of the cases had concordance. I had thought that we would get around 70 or 80 percent. So it's actually really good. So we don't, this implies, you know, it's not a huge number of cases, but not a biopsy ends up with a resection because they don't always take it out. It does imply that we're probably okay testing biopsies because the concordance is pretty good. It's still going to be, do we only have a couple small bits? Do we have a mixed tumor where what you see in biopsy doesn't match what you see in the resection specimen? And if you end up in a case with significant heterogeneity, uh, could there be a difference between the biopsy? Uh, and that we will not really be able to predict that, except maybe for the mixed tumors. The discordance seemed to be a problem more in cases with 2-plus staining, but in a case with biopsies with extensive 3-plus staining, there was generally really good concordance. But again, I would still encourage generous sampling of the tumors. Breast cancer, we know that metastatic lesions do not always correlate with the primary cancer because it recurs so quickly after the uh, initial diagnosis. They not to biopsy the metastatic lesions, so we don't actually have very many cases to test. I think we've got a few that we're working through, but I can't really give you even preliminary results here. And again, this is uh, going to be if the oncologists are concerned about this, they're going to have to start biopsying these metastatic lesions, and we'll have to do a study and sort it out. But I can't really answer that right now. So now, the current testing algorithm is to test at the first diagnosis of gastric or gastroesophageal junction tumors, intestinal and diffuse. Because we want to test at the first diagnosis, CCO strongly recommends that this should be sent by pathologists at the time of diagnosis without waiting for the patient to go to the oncologist. And because we now can say that the biopsies are pretty good, we shouldn't have to wait for the surgery. And the reason that this was decided was that the patients have very little time to live. If the patient ends up in the oncologist's office and the oncologist has to trigger the test, then it will take time to go for that request to go back to the original pathology lab have a case dug out, have it sent off to the testing center, and wait for the result to come back. This puts uh, at least a week or two day of the HER2 result. Does these patients need to start chemo, the correct chemo as soon as possible? It's so that we over-test a little bit rather than make ones that need it wait. Really, in Ontario, you're talking about approximately 1,000 cases a year. So you're not talking about huge numbers of cases. And so CO has decided that the benefit to the patients that will get the treatment is worth the cost of testing at the first diagnosis. So I'd encourage you that when you get a case that's been, that is the first diagnosis of cancer in these areas, to please send it off to your local testing center. As I mentioned, initially all cancers will be tested by both immuno and situ hybridization. CCO will only fund one test per patient, so I accidentally tested to the biopsy and the resection specimen because they were sent to by to separate centers a week or two apart, and I didn't recognize that they, it was the same patient. But unless the t there's a technical reason why the test failed, they only get one test. And I've had cases sent in that were bone marrow biopsies that went through decal and that didn't work. I've had cytology specimens sent in. That didn't work. And every once in a while, as I said, you get biopsies where it's cut through and there's no tumor left in the block. Well, then hopefully there's been another biopsy or a resection that we can test. So these are the current testing centers. And I apologize if I don't list all the people, the different centers who are doing that. I just put the leads, uh, the people who to send it to. And in order to minimize chaos of who to send it to, you, you don't really to choose who to send it to. It's assigned according to what LIN you're in. So you can find LIN on this list and know who to send it to. We split LIN 7 between uh, Sunnybrook and, and St. Mike's here. So 
see working pretty well. And, and actually, that went faster than I thought, so I'd just like to acknowledge all the people that contributed both to the validation and the other studies, uh, Dr. Andrea Grin and Dr. Christine bresden masley who have both put in a lot of work on both the clinical and the side here at St. Michael's Hospital. Our technologists here at St. Michael's Hospital, who did so much of the uh, insight to hybridization and the immuno. And uh, Eugene Sion would add Hannah up at Sunnybrook and Polly Henry, who was working with them on the validation up, up at Sunnybrook. That's it. Are there any questions? Okay, um, we've got a few questions that have come in. Um, and just a reminder, uh, please, if you want to send a question, use the uh, chat feature. Um, and um, please put your institution's name, the name of the person posing the question, and the, the question. The first one is from Dr. Bikani from uh, UAH in Edmonton, and um, I'm showing where early stage HER2 new gas uh, cancers um, are. Um, sorry, I can't read that. Uh, sorry. Sorry. Bikani from Edmonton. Are there studies showing where early stage HER2 new gastric cancers are furthered by trastuzumab? Uh, I don't know, I'll uh, that by that study that was mentioned. Uh, oh, um, are there studies showing where the early of the help by, by um, her therapy? Oh, so, um, at this stage, HER2 testing is, or sorry, HER2 treatment is only allowed or is only funded for advanced advanced or metastatic breast can or gastric cancer. That means that even if they are positive as early gastric cancers, we don't yet have neoadjuvant um, therapy. The oncologists hope to get it because they think that it will prevent metastatic uh, and recurrent tumors, but it is not yet allowed. Uh, covers it. I mean, there's no reason to think that they wouldn't respond. It's just unless they get out, not allowed to be treated. Okay. The second question from Dr. Bacani from Edmonton. Would you expect or predict her to new testing for esophageal adenocarcinomas on our horizon? And are there recent uh, studies in clinical trials out there? I uh, clinical trials. Um, I find the definition is is between distal esophageal and G-junction tumors is difficult. And if you look at the CAP uh, esophageal synoptic notes, there's the definition of what is a G-junction tumor versus a distal esophageal tumor is difficult. And we've had this discussion with CCO. I, our, um, our gastroenterologists say the vast majority of Barrett's-associated adenocarcinomas occur within five centimeters of the GE junction. And they, some definitions, that means that these, quote, esophageal adenocarcinomas are actually GE junction tumors. We know GE junction tumors um, have a high rate of HER2 amplification and respond well to trastuzumab therapy. There are definitely studies in what we call esophageal adenocarcinoma showing approximately the same rate of HER2 amplification in these cases. I would assume that it would work, but I don't have any proof of it. You and I have had discussions about cases where which are sent into us as as, as distal esophageal, um, we have to take it on faith that these are GE junction tumors because we, being referral centers for this testing, we can't really be the ones doing detective work saying, well, you know, uh, yeah, sure, it's touching the GE junction. We don't know. Um, so just uh, assuming that they're GE junction tumors, but a lot of them. The definitions are funny. I really can't answer specifically. Third question is from Dr. David Drummond in London, Ontario. Uh, in your biopsy resection study, did the resection specimens show less heterogeneity than you would have expected to account for the good correlation? I don't think that they did. Uh, certainly some of the cases that were negative were heterogene heterogeneous. But uh, I don't think our specimens were any different than any of the other studies. We had significant heterogeneity in a lot of our things. But I think study was pretty representative. 
surprised too. I really thought we would be around seventy percent. Uh, fourth question uh, from Dr. Bakani uh, in Edmonton. Have you observed HER2 immunohistochemistry chemistry, three positivity, and dysplastic lesions? Um, when we went to Germany to take the course on how to read HER2 amplification and gastric cancers, uh, the group there felt that, yes, they did see positivity and dysplastic lesions, and, and honestly, they said they would keep that. Uh, we haven't really looked at that yet. I we very cautious of interpreting pure positivity in the dysplastic stuff lying a tumor if the tumor is negative. Um, I don't think I've seen it much in low grade, but I think that's an area that uh, we would like to look at. Okay, question five is from Dr. Vivian Frankel in Ottawa. Is there a standardized HER2 request form? And what information is required besides patient ID data? I think there, we had done a request form, on this, which is, I think, available on the CCO website. But generally, things just come in. I need a copy of the report because every once in a while, um, the wrong block is sent. I've had blocks sent in that were resection margins that were negative, And then you don't do that until you do the things and spend the money because they come in as blocks or unstained slides. I don't require the form, basically. If you send it to me with a note saying, please do HER2, I'll do the HER2. Uh, question number six from Dr. Ramsey. Uh, for D1 resections, should sampling of lymph nodes be concentrated on lesser curvature? I think the lesser curvature versus greater curvature makes a difference. Um, it's more the absolute number always tell exactly where you are. If they're just giving you a lump of fat attached, you can't really be sure of the location when you're looking at the D2 nodes. I don't think which D1 nodes are positive or negative um, is currently relevant. That may change. Asco is coming up. I'm a little afraid to find out what they're going to come back with this year. Okay. I'm going to squeeze my question. It's a little bit of a follow-up question, uh, Kathy. Is, um, how do you know you told it whether it's a D1 and a D2, and, and how do you uh, judge as to whether it's a D0 or a, you know, a good uh, D1 lymphadenectomy? Um, I don't think we can tell by looking at the specimen. Um, I would, I swear, you, have, you could ask your surgeon and see what they're actually doing. I think we just have to really look really as hard as we can for many lymph nodes and make it more of a focus because... You know, I'm sure the PAs are, are looking for these things, but it's not until we really start enforcing a, lim a specific number that we know what we're getting. Since they're not doing that cassette method as they're doing in, in Asia here, my impression that from looking at the cases that we've had here is that it just looks like there's a little bit more fat. You can't really be sure whether you're just being a, a generous D1 versus a uh, a, a D2. And I point out that apparently part of the reason D2s are more difficult in North America is that, frankly, we're chubbier here. Ski Asian people are apparently a lot easier to get a D2 recession on. So, so Kathy, do you think it's worthwhile maybe approaching CCO to maybe do a community of practice on, you know, on gastric cancers, you know, from, from a surgeon's perspective and a pathologist's perspective and, and the HER2 new, just like they've done for... Um, you know, for the lymph nodes and colon resection, and, and they're doing now for thoracic surgery uh, for lung cancers. The oncologists would, would really like that because oncologists who are treating a lot of gastric cancer, I mean, um, we've got Christine Bresden who calls me a lot of the time on these cases, and, and she's very keen on this. And it is probably worth discussing so that we can be the curve on this one and not just wait until the surgeons and the oncologists come and demand it of us, but if we start advocating for things now, then it's an advantage for us. I'll put that request through to, to CCO, Kathy. Okay, um, next question is from Dr. Mark Reckenberg. How do you report heterogeneous HER2 expression and how well do heterogeneous tumors respond to tratuzumab? I don't think the Togatrol broke it down by the degree of heterogeneity. So I can't tell you that 
the homogeneous ones um, respond differently than one that's a solid three plus from wall to wall. It would make sense that something that's definitely three plus positive would do better than something that's 12% three plus positive, but I don't know the answer for that. In terms of reporting, uh, I don't make a comment of that. Well, I might put a little comment saying this is a mixed tumor and the intestinal part is positive. Um, in the end, I just report as positive or negative. I don't want anybody getting confused. Anonymous question here. The reason why it hurts your new test for neuroendocrine tumors of stomach? As far as I know, they don't express it. I uh, don't know if anybody's really looked in detail at neuroendocrine tumors. If you had one that was an adeno neuroendocrine that had some adenocarcinoma features, it would be worth testing. But right now, neuroendocrine um, is excluded. A pure endocrine tumor would be excluded from testing criteria. Um, we have a question here from Dr. Mona Bashara from uh, Grand River Hospital in uh, Kitchener. Uh, discontinuous serosal deposits on the greater or lesser omentum, uh, should they be called M1? Is that correct? Um, hmm, that's a tough one. Uh, I think there are some groups of lymph nodes and some groups of deposits which are sitting on the line between the two. Um, hmm, on the greater omentum. I think that if... I'd probably be tempted to put them in M1, but I don't know that there's good evidence for that. I'm not, honestly, I'm not entirely sure what I would do with that. Uh, next question is from uh, Dr. B. Ladigan at uh, St. Boniface Hospital in Winnipeg, Manitoba. You mentioned or recommended her to be interpreted by pathologists who see a large number of these from the perspective of maintaining competency. Do you anticipate any minimum numbers for competency to be recommended, uh, similar to what uh, CAP suggests or mandates, let's say, for breast specimens? For our Ontario groups that are doing the testing, CCO is saying 100 cases per year. So, and in some ways, that should be per pathologist, not per group. Um, so, if you're doing it within a group of several people, if you have 100 cases each, you should be showing each other a significant number of cases so that you maintain, so you keep your eye in, essentially. Uh, so, it is possible to do it with lower numbers, but you need to cooperate. So Kathy, do you do double sign out then for her to news, or do you do, or does each of the GI pathologists at your center? you know, gets to do one week and just signs it out? Do you We're waiting sign months, out? more or less, but we have a very low threshold to show each other cases. A straightforward 3-plus that's ish amplified doesn't need to get shown, and one that's completely blue also is going to be negative. Um, we show each other a lot of the difficult cases, and it's straightforward when you look at Hannah's paper, and it sounds straightforward when I present it, but there are a significant number of difficult cases where you're looking at it going, well, is it really visible at 5 plus uh, at the 5 by hour? Is it a 3? Is it a 2? Um, pick what fields to count for the in situ hybridization is, is quite difficult in these cases because it can be very patchy. And uh, I would point this, we've only been doing this since November of 2011. This is a, a new field, and we're still pulling our way along a little bit. So, experience as we go, it's important to show each other as many as you can, but, but once you're past your validation stage where we looked at all of them together pretty much, uh, then we're fairly dependent. We don't, you know, this is a significant uh, workload, so we, we can't afford the time to all look at both of them. We're just, we alternate. Okay. Um, I have a question. Um, if the clinicians request testing in Barrett's, um, should we do it? Uh, again, that goes back to what's the definition of a G-junction tumor, and um, there are email interchanges with CCO on this that C I think is taking the side of if it's a purely esophageal cancer and doesn't touch the GE junction, you cannot test it. If it comes in contact with the GE junction, it is a GE junction tumor and you can test it very difficult for us as pathologists to know if in biopsy. If you have a resection specimen, you can figure out where it is, or at least where the center of mass is, and whether it's touching the junction. But on biopsies, 
um, I think if the clinician tells you it's a G-junction tumor, it's okay. If telling you it's purely esophageal, then no, it's not valid for testing. Dr. Michael Troster uh, in Stratford General Hospital. As regards to regional nodes, should we be doing immunosochemistry to detect micromets in these nodes and is <laughs> significant? Um, there, were, there was a step back in, I think, 2005 or 2006 looking at the lymph nodes and doing multiple step sections through and doing immunohistochemistry, and they found a significant proportion that had isolated tumor cells and micromets. Just the way we used to treat uh, the lymph nodes in, in breast cancer, actually. But it was interesting that the outcome of that study didn't depend on whether or not they found the micromets in the isolated tumor cells. It depended on how many lymph nodes came out. So in, we find the lymph nodes is more important than documenting that the proper section was done at this point, from what we tell. It's a, it's a funny thing. But I, at this point, I would not advocate that we do a lot of extra work and spend a lot of money looking for the micromets. I mean, maybe cut a couple extra levels if you want to go that far. But or, you know, maybe treat them like the sentinel lymph nodes and make sure they're cut thinly. But don't go immuno at this point. There's no proof that it adds much. Uh, non anonymous question: If a lymph node biopsy with mets, um, should it be sent for her to new or wait for the gastric biopsy? I don't think I've ever had the situation where I got a lymph node. Uh, at that point, usually they getting a lymph node, usually because the surgeon's gone in, decided he can't do a gastrectomy, and is just taking uh, something to document the tumor and is getting out. So either the patient's already had a biopsy somewhere else or they just completely skipped that step. If that's all you've got, then send it. If I've had, you know, this one specimen gets sent, it doesn't entirely matter which one at this point. Next question is from Dr. Ken Newell in uh, Great Bruce Regional Health Center. Is there any data to support the use of ancillary techniques such as goof solution to increase the number of lymph nodes found in gastric resection specimens? Any data about it, but if you're, you've already got that method available in your hospital, it probably does simplify finding the lymph nodes. We don't currently do that. It's still digging through the fat. i got to tell you, I told our oncologist about how we get lymph nodes. She was kind of shocked. She didn't realize it was such a low-tech thing. Um, if it becomes a major issue, then more places might be encouraged to go to one of the clearing solutions, but I don't think it's absolutely necessary. Most of the time, you can find most of these lymph nodes if you're willing to put in the time squishing through the fat. Um, next question is from Hamilton from Dr. Jennifer Ramsey. For resection specimens, should we be taking a fresh piece of tumor for two new rather than waiting after fixation of the organ? Like a section. Um, we haven't done that. We tried it uh, when Dr. Mulligan was here. We tried it on breast cancers that we were worried that if they uh, sat too long, um, we it can it might help. The problem is are you taking the best section in the end because. If you went with a tumor that's got a variable degree of differentiation or it's a mixed tumor, you want to select the block that has the best differentiated intestinal type tumor. And if you're taking a random section at the time, you know that you're going to get that. It's probably just better to make sure that you've opened the stomach as quickly as possible and taken a couple of cuts into the tumor to make sure it fixes well. And then you can select the most appropriate block at the time of looking at it that if you took a scout section, you'd feel like you have to say that, even when it's not the best specimen. Oh, and before I forget, probably better than sending unstained slides. Unstained slides a badly uh, for this test, so that if they are sitting around in a mail room for a couple of days, uh, the staining tends to decrease. So we prefer blocks. If you send um, unstained slides, please send them as soon as possible. Our next question is from uh, Phoebe uh, Shakri. Do you report ITC as positive nodes? Uh, they had a case with 12 nodes positive for ITC, uh, no micro-mets or macro-mets. Um, again, it's not strictly the definition of a positive lymph node, so you would have to put it in the comment field. Uh, 
of the of your report. I think you know to me I would tempted to put it in the synoptic report, but it doesn't really have a definition for ITCs. Again, you're, you're sort of making it up as you go along, and we don't really have guidance on this. And I, I think that paper back in HASP was interesting that they often found them predict survival. So is it really a positive node? I don't, you know, really have anything to guide us on this. I think it would be personal preference, honestly. You need to put it in somewhere so that they know that they're there. Whether you put in just a comment or you add it into the synoptic, uh, I, you know, honestly, I'd, at this point, I'd probably put it in the synoptic. But so it's a bit of a follow-up question uh, from me, uh, Kathy. Um, you said that the lymphadenectomy is up, actually probably a better prognostic than the number of positive nodes and, and greater than 15. Uh, do you know what Ontario's rate is, sort of the average uh, lymph node yield in gastrectomy specimens? Because uh, that's very amenable, the discrete data field reporting, to sort of get that uh, data. And is it worth, um, hopefully, if we roll out the surgical path quality indicators um, throughout the province, is that something that maybe we can start looking at uh, to see where we can improve? In the end, the CCO data... Some, but I don't know that anybody's ever pulled it out to see how we're doing. And I, I, I suspect it'll vary uh, between hospitals depending on what your surgeon is doing. It would be interesting to know. We might be better than we think. I'll, I'll see if I can follow up on that, uh, Kathy. Uh, next question, again, is from Hamilton, uh, from Jennifer Ramsey. Biopsies may have edge artifact. How do you interpret um, those biopsies when that occurs? I haven't seen too much uh, severe edge artifact. Uh, in Dr. Hannah's paper, she shows an example of some luminal staining uh, in some tissue that looks kind of cracked at edge, which uh, she attributes to edge artifact. Um, I, I do try to look, look more at the center of the tumor, but if I'm convinced that it's real, I will count it. You do have to think about it in biopsies. Okay. The next question is from University of Alberta, uh, Edmonton, from Dr. Bacani again. Have you tested Krukenberg tumors? And if yes, are they likely to be negative due to their typically diffuse system morphology? I had a couple of ovarian um, specimens sent in for testing. I, I have to suppose that that's the only tissue they had on those patients. If I remember correctly, I think of the two I've had, they have both been in diffuse and they have both been negative. So we'll test them. Right, because they are usually diffuse, the chances of them being positive are pretty slim. Um, I've got a couple of uh, questions. Um, that was sort of last submitted question that's come in. Uh, and, we'll, and maybe I'll ask mine in case there's some more um, questions coming in. Um, Kathy, is there a, you'd mentioned um, that in the checklist there's nothing there to really capture, you know, hereditary gastric cancer uh, findings. Um, so is there anything you would like to see change so that we can submit to the College of American Pathologists, uh, Pathology Electronic Reporting Committee or the PERT Committee uh, to you know, maybe add something to the present checklist uh, that you would like to see? Um, it might be better to ask Aaron Pollitt about that because he obviously had probably the most experience in Ontario uh, with hereditary gastric cancers. Um, it might be worth adding at least a, a checkbox for multiple tumors um, and maybe a, a history box for uh, if, if you know that the patient has uh, hereditary gastric cancer. Thanks. Um, one more question has come in from uh, Dr. Wujanarko. Um, is preoperative PET scan routinely performed? And are there any intraoperative central node examination? I'm pretty sure that PET scanning has not been shown to be particularly useful in stomach cancer at this point, uh, so I'm pretty sure that our patients are not getting it. So lymph nodes, um, no, because they end up, there's not one specific zone that the tumor to drain to, other than they tend, they usually go first to the D1 nodes and then to the D2 nodes, but I think there are papers showing that sometimes they skip entirely over the D1 nodes and go straight out to D2. Um, so 
no, I don't think Sentinel nodes are useful right now, and I hope they never become so. Um, this is the last question. So, um, anything else that's coming in? Um, on uh, behalf of Cancer Care Ontario Partnership and Canadian Association of Pathologists, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Kathy Stroitka for a truly comprehensive, informative, and very clear presentation today. Thank you, Kathy. This is the fourth session of the 2013 series of uh, CAP list presentations. And we welcome your comments and suggestions for ways to ensure these sessions are informative and relevant to your practice. Please include your feedback and suggestions as part of your completed online evaluations. Once the recording of this presentation becomes available, it will be made available for wide distribution via links posted by CCO, CPAC, and the Canadian Association of Pathologists. Actually, this recording will be available for review at your convenience and is not restricted. A reminder, both the live and recorded presentations are eligible for CME credits. In order to receive those credits for attending or viewing the educational sessions, you must complete an evaluation form for each session accessed or viewed in its entirety. The web-based survey has been included in the session notices distributed prior to each session. Uh, please note that the CME certificates for each of the CAP checklist education sessions will only be issued one month uh, from the presentation date. The sessions will remain available electronically for an undetermined period of time, and CME certificates will only be issued for one month. And so please refer to the session notice uh, for the exact deadline date. Our next scheduled CAP checklist educational uh, session is on Wednesday, April the 10th. That's on renal pelvis, ureter, and urethra by uh, Dr. Kola Tropkov. So, Kathy, thank you very, very much, and um, good afternoon.